Today, we'll hear the passion story from the Gospel of Matthew, from chapter 27. Early in the morning, all the chief priests and the elders of the people made their plans how to have Jesus executed. So they bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate, the Roman governor. Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied. When he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. And Pilate asked him, Don't you hear the testimony they are bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply not even to a single charge. Now it was the governor's custom at the festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time, they had a well-known prisoner whose name was Jesus Barabbas. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, Which one do you want me to release to you? Jesus Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Messiah? For he knew it was out of self-interest that they had handed Jesus over to him. While Pilate was sitting in the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you? Asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then with this Jesus who is called the Messiah? Pilate asked them. And they all answered, crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed? Asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. This is your responsibility. And he released Barabbas to them. But he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. And they twisted together a crown of thorns and they set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand. They knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. And they spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene whose name was Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots, and sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, 
You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him, for he said, I am the son of God. From noon until three in the afternoon, a darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, he's calling Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar and put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. But the rest said, leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified. And exclaimed, surely this was the Son of God. Many women were there, watching from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. Going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body, and Pilate ordered that it be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. We tell a story this day in which it appears that even the Son of God feels abandoned by God and cries out, why have you forsaken me? I think we need to remember that the very human Jesus responds just like the rest of us do. That we can feel abandoned and forsaken, left behind, alone. And yet he's not. The women are there. They have followed him from Galilee to care for his needs. As the day ends and Jesus is laid in the tomb, the Mary is there sitting opposite the tomb. I, I, I think she came back the next day too. And the next day. Jesus isn't alone. 
God is with Jesus in all of this hurt and suffering and grief. And yet even Jesus, the very human Jesus, can't see it. The women may not be able to do anything. They may not be able to save him. But they can do something. They're there. They are sharing his grief and his hurt and his suffering. And when he is gone, they are there remembering him. They are still there three days later. They are amongst Jesus' followers, the last and the first to see him alive. The very human Jesus feels lost and broken, as we so often do. And yet, God is there. God is there in the women wanting to help him, in the women being simply present in his hurt and suffering. And end. And they will be there at his new beginning.